Greetings and welcome to the online Optum Learning Series session. Today is the 222nd session of the OOLS. And uh, we are glad to have Dr. Santan Biswas with us. Dr. Santan uh, is a lecturer in optometry at the Aston University in Birmingham, UK. And he is the undergraduate module leader of the clinical practice development. Uh, his research areas are including experimental models of glaucoma and myopia, early detection and diagnosis of glaucoma, myopia control using the light therapy, optical therapy, as well as pharmacological modalities. He also spends uh, some time in ocular imaging as well as using artificial intelligence in ophthalmic care. Uh, he's well published. Uh, he's published over 35 peer reviewed articles in uh, reputed journals and is also an active reviewer of several optometry as well as ophthalmology journals. Uh, so today Dr. Santan is going to take us through I think a very important probably a common eye condition in terms of uh, seeing it routinely I would say and it's the prevalence also is getting a, pro, uh, a bit higher uh, which is glaucoma and he's going to tell us about the diagnostic challenges, the advancements and some future directions in terms of the disease. So uh, welcome Dr. Biswas uh, onto the OLS platform and uh, let me just leave the screen time to you, please. Thank you for Krudin for giving this opportunity. Uh, so before I start, good morning, good afternoon or good evening to whoever listening this to this presentation. So today's topic is, as I mentioned, glaucoma, diagnostic challenges, advancements and future directions. So I'll start with th this topic, glaucoma is quite complicated. So I'll start with the basic simple and then go forward towards a bit more complicated ideas and what is future of glaucoma research. So my name is Dr. Scienton. I'm doing research in both glaucoma as well as myopia at Aston University. Okay, so glaucoma, as you all know, is a multifactorial disease. It has affected by several factors. And it also involves the anterior as well as the posterior segment of the eye. So the entire eye is affected, starting from anterior to posterior, especially optic nerve head, macula. You, we all know that intraocular pressure is the only modified risk factor. That means that uh, the way to prevent glaucoma is only to reduce the intraocular pressure. Corneal thickness, curvature, the angle, which is the idea corneal angle, everything affects the glaucoma. Also, visual field and electroretinogram are also important things in glaucoma. We'll go into each one in detail. So, as we all know, glaucoma diagnosis is done based on structural and functional changes. So, structural means retinal anatomy, functional means how the performed patient is performing the visual field test. So, diagnosis based on the new retinal rim thickness, the NRR thickness based on the photographs, and nerve fiber layer thickness based on OCT and visual field effect. So intraocular pressure is just a risk factor. It doesn't define glaucoma. Pressure high doesn't mean glaucoma or pressure low doesn't mean no glaucoma. It can be anything. So mostly what we do is we go to a serous OCT map and we check the RNFL thickness map and deviation map. If the thickness map shows a pattern like the figure A, which is the top, uh, red, red is the top superior portion and below red is the inferior portion, it shows a normal healthy uh, retinal thickness. C correspondingly, the right side picture, which is the RNFL thickness division map, shows everywhere is gray picture. There's no color. But when you come down to the picture B, it shows that the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber bundle is less in the superior and inferior regions, the top and the bottom. It's only yellowish. Red is less. It shows that the nerve fiber is getting thinned due to glaucoma. And on the right side, when you see the RNFL thickness division map, there are some red and yellow points. So what is that? I'll come to it in more detail later. But the red and yellow dot shows that there are some changes happening in the retina. So now if you go here, it shows that red and yellow dots now in more detail. So basically, that machine serious, what it does is it counts how many pixels in that image are yellow, how many pixels are red. So each yellow pixel means that yellow is the thickness of that particular pixel, that particular region is beyond or lower than the 95th centile. And red means even worse. It's even less than the 19th centile. So yellow means borderline. Red means it's very severe defect. Redness is very thin. So thickness map and thickness deviation map, they are the most important criteria based on which we define a patient is having a defect in the retina or not. 
So diagnosis, how we is made? So glaucoma optics changes, that is narrow retinal rim and optic disc excavation with or without defects. The definition is of course complicated, but it says that there must be defect in OCD, there must be defect in the stereo photographs, the optic nerve pictures, which shows that there's glaucoma definitely. Along with that, this is what is pre-perimetric glaucoma. There's no visual field involved. Only OCD using defect and stereo photographs showing defect in the optic disc. Now, when you add visual field to it, then you, when you, uh, you apply Anderson's criteria to it, what is Anderson's criteria? It says that there's a visual field defect, which is definitely when three or more points has visual field defect. So we'll not go in that, that detail about it. So basically, this is a picture of a patient with glaucoma, which is perimetric glaucoma. Thickness map showing RNFL thinning, division map showing there are defect spots, visual field showing there's a loss of visual field, and stereo photograph also showing the diff disc definitely has a defect. So when all these criteria are met, you can say a patient has glaucoma. So what are the challenges now involved in this glaucoma? So glaucoma, the major challenge is myopia because glaucoma and myopia, they can coexist. That means a single eye can have glaucoma as well as myopia, or there can be only glaucoma without myopia or only myopia without glaucoma. So this presents one of the biggest clinical challenges since the detection of glaucomatous nerve damage in high myopic eyes is quite difficult. So we'll see with pictures how myopic eyes differ from glaucomatous eyes. So in highly myopic eyes, the color contrast between the pink retinal rim and the disc decreases due to an increased pallor in the rim. So basically, in uh, myopic eyes, the pale region becomes more. It spreads around the disc, which makes the disc and cup margin identification quite difficult. You don't know where's the disc, where's the cup. How to understand the cup disc ratio becomes quite difficult. Next is, if you look at the red arrow, the red arrow shows the height from the ILM, which is internal limiting membrane, till the cup bottom, that red region is deepens in glaucoma. It be becomes thicker and thick, uh, becomes deeper in glaucoma. But in my opinion, what happens? Everything gets stretched. So when this cup gets stretched sideways, then what happens? The deeping cup becomes narrowed. That means the if you see my arrow, if a cursor arrow, the yellow mark which is shown here, it goes up. So the deep cup becomes narrowed because of the my pick changes. So it's giving a false uh, idea to you that the cupping is less and the patient is having a good optic nerve head, which is not true because patient has lost the nerve fiber layers. It got deepened just because the my pair progressed. The cup got stretched and the cup deep cup become shallow cup. It's not deep anymore. So that's an artifact. Next thing is the rotation of the disc. So the first picture shows the disc having no rotation. It's vertically elongated straight but the next picture and the following picture it shows that the disc is not straight it's tilted obliquely tilted so that's the problem that we face when you see a patient with myopia it's quite difficult to identify the cup and disc ratio next comes assessment of the rnfl layer in the peripapal region it becomes difficult you can you see the there are bright striations along the nerve fiber layer. So those bright striations are because the increased brightness of the underlying tissue, which happens in myopic eyes. Because in myopic eyes, when everything gets stretched, the retina becomes thinned. And when retina is thin, you can see the underlying peripapillary tissue, which gives a bright uh, feature in the retinal photo, which makes the, again, uh, distinguishing cup disc tissue difficult. Third is the alpha, beta, gamma, delta zone. So delta zone is the closest to the disc next becomes the gamma then beta then finally is alpha at the outermost layer so this uh, alpha and beta zones they're associated with glaucoma whereas gamma and delta zones are associated with uh, myopia so when the zones appear so many zones appear it's quite difficult to delineate and identify which is what so you don't know the peripapillary atrophy is because of glaucoma or myopia or both that's one challenge now, myopic eyes can have more temporal shifting of the disc. So can you see the first picture is showing quite normal. The blood vessel entering the disc is quite normal. But see, the right middle picture, the vessel becomes kinked. It becomes shifted right side. And the third picture is even more. So with the increasing disc tilt, the blood vessel changing its course along with the disc. So 
what happens is that because of that the nerve fiber layer appears to be temporarily converged i'll show a picture of that later how it appears to be in oct so basically the in my pair due to stretching the nerve fiber layer got temporarily converged giving a false defect in the oct also visual field defects have been observed to develop in hymapic eyes which are unrelated to glaucoma so the visual field defect but not about glaucoma it's about myopia so that's a problem so the use of objective parameters like oct hrt are very important along with visual field defect to definitely identify whether there's a glaucoma or not so myopic eyes may be structurally quite distorted because of posterior staphyloma so we all know that there's a disease called posterior staphyloma in the macula so because of that the macula may be atrophied or thinned or thickened so any change may happen and when you do OCT on that patient you will appear that oh my god this patient is having a defect in the macula which is not true which is because of the macula uh, because of the myopia so how to you may say that okay either way both are defect right but but the thing is that glaucoma should be progressive myopia is not progressive after a certain age when a child has uh, posterior staphylococcus for example at after 18 or 20 years of age the progression will stop but for glaucoma it will keep on going because there is glaucoma it is progressive the definition of glaucoma is progressive optic nerve disorder so if there's no progression there's not a glaucoma it's just a uh, myopia or something else so high myopic eyes are falsely overdiagnosed with glaucoma if you are not don't take care to distinguish between whether it's glaucoma or myopia so this is what it looks like so when you check the thickness map and division map a normal healthy myopic eye which is the top picture which is long excellent 27 and the spherical equivalent of minus 7 almost so what it shows it shows that in the thickness map the uh, arnfeld bundle is thin in the superior portion and there's a lot of defect around the whole disc so it, it, when you see such a picture, you'll think that, oh my God, this patient definitely has glaucoma. There's an RNA defect, patient may have glaucoma, which is not true. This whole change is because of the uh, uh, myopic change. Why is that so? I'll come in more detail in the corresponding slides. Don't worry. Why is that happening? And the picture below shows that this patient is having a low myopia. So for low myopia, this is still okay. But for a patient with high myopia and with longer excellent, definitely there's a false defect. Okay, so this table shows you that there's a ch very high chance that a patient with high myopia will be falsely classified as glaucomatous. So the total range is 12 to 47 percent of people with healthy myopic eyes are classified abnormally as glaucomatous using OCT. This risk becomes even higher when the exit length is longer and higher myopia. So what is important is that to know that the, whenever we test a patient in OCT, the value you're getting is compared against the age matched control a normal which is called a normative database so whenever your patient's values are lesser than the normative database which you have stored in the ocd machine the ocd gives a flag to you whether yellow flag or red flag saying that okay this patient has a thin retina so this patient may have a rnfl defect if it is below 95 percent centile it's yellow if it's less than 19 percentile it's red so the problem arises from the normal data. So when the, when the study was done long back in 2012 by Knight and published in Ar Ar Archive of Ophthalmology, what they did is they took patients who are normal totally in terms of emetropia also. So they had no emetropia, they're totally emetropic patients, totally normal, and they got the data, the thickness profile, and put them in the OCD machine. So whenever you're comparing the current day patients with those data who are emetropic, and your patient is myopic so of course there's a difference myopic has a different kind of uh, rnfl profile whether the emetropic is different so ultimately it leads to a false defect classifying in the oct so as i mentioned to you earlier there's a temporal convergence of the superior and inferior rnfl bundles with increasing refractive error so the axial length is increasing getting stretched because of the high myopia and the inferior and superior bundles getting going towards the temporal side as the picture showed before so the normative, normative data which is there in ocd machines currently are not very suitable for detecting abnormalities in myopic eyes especially with high myopia okay so this picture again is showing a report of oct especially serious ocd in which you can see that this is a patient with high myopia and you can see that the average thickness is quite okay it's 94 and 95 and the thickness profile also is quite red but 
if you see the bundle, you see it's tilted, it's going towards temporal side. So if you know how to read this map, there's a right eye on the on the left side, is right right eye, and the uh, the region on the towards the table, the checker checkbox table in the middle is the nasal side. So the bundles are shifted towards the temporal side, away from the nasal side in both the eyes, if you notice. And correspondingly, in the thickness division map, there's a big red dot here showing that there's RNFL defect, which is not true. Just because in my pick eyes, the bundles shift to a temporal side, that gives a false appearance of a defect in the inferior and superior regions, where you're supposed to have a, a normal uh, thickness in a normal eye, which is not my pick. Similarly, the temporal side, because there's a temporal convergence of the retina, the temporal side is white. What does that mean? This sector is white because it shows that as if this patient has a supra threshold. I mean, a thickness of thickness retina, which is superior to even normal individuals. It's very high, very thick. Again, which is not true. So re in reality, this patient has a normal thickness. Just the bundles are shifted little on the temporal side, which has not been captured in the OCT. So there's one more example here. This also is a patient with high myopia without glaucoma. It just shows as if the bundles are shifted temporarily and there's a defect in the eye, which is not true. So what are the con considerations you should follow in patients with myopic myopia? So macula is also affected, you should remember, is affected in high myopia. Similar to optic nerve head, similar, same thing happens in macula. Because the whole eye is getting stretched, the bundles are also shifted in the macula as well. So myopic macular degeneration, for instance, can cause abnormal thinning from patchy atrophy or thickening due to retinoschisis of the retinal layer. So whenever you see a patient is having some kind of a defect in the macula or optic nerve due to myopia, you have to think something else to do something else. You cannot follow the standard protocol. Excel elongation and stretching of the globe may also cause thinning of the macular GCIPL, which is ganglion cell interplexiform layer. Also, you should remember that central or paracentral scotomas, that is visual field defect, may appear in my pig eyes. So, uh, and these visual field defects are often missed on 24-2 perimetry. So when you perform a 10-2, you may find that, okay, this patient with myopia and glaucoma has visual field defect. So uh, you may get overdiagnosed. Sometimes you may get underdiagnosed as well. So patient with myopic glaucoma may have visual field defect, which can be missed in 24-2. So you should perform 10-2 in case patient has myopia. The mode of optical correction the patient is wearing while performing visual field also very important. I'm sure you've learned in your visual field lessons that you must use contact lenses uh, for patient with thick high myopia because the peripheral regions are, the lenses are quite thick. So if you perform a visual field with thick lens, patient may not see the peripheral regions and patient will not press the button, which give result to a uh, peripheral defect. Okay, so also it's important that PAC, primary angle closure is quite common, is uncommon in myopia, but it's not negligible. Some people with myopia do have angle closure. So angle closure is not always associated with hyperopia and emetropia. It can also come in myopia. So it's important to perform a gonioscopy or antechamber OCT to make sure you know that, okay, this patient angles are open or closed. So you can see a picture here. The picture A shows a almost closed angle, whereas picture B is an open angle. So what is the conclusion of this section? I have not finished it. So this section conclusion is, says that structural imaging using OCT has emerged as a crucial and very beneficial for diagnosis and management of glaucoma. But there's a fundamental flaw or weakness because what we're doing is we're measuring a patient's retinal thickness compared to a age-based normative data, which may not be very accurate or true because the patient may have different gender, may have different race, may have different MIP profile, a lot of things can vary. So there's a fundamental flaw to compare some with something with something else. Comparison is always detrimental, it's not good. This weakness becomes especially apparent in the assessment of myopic eyes as the shape of the eye with myopia very greatly from my emetropes as well as from each other. So what is important is that we should have some myopia specific databases. That means you collect data of myopic patients who are normal and then compare them with other myopic patients who are also you're thinking normal. So based on excellent length match data. So you take a patient with excellent 24 and compare the same excellent length of 24 with somebody else who has come to visit you. But 
The question is that, which is the best structural assessment for myopiglacoma? But there's no simple answer to it. You cannot say OCD is best or HRT or GDX. There's no simple answer to it. We'll go through that slowly. So it's important that you understand the limitations and source of error of each test. Then you know that what is good and what is not good for your patient, which can give rise to false positive, which may not give false positive for your patient. So developing a development of better diagnostic strategies will help in the early and accurate diagnosis of myopiglacoma. So how to do that, we'll see. So as I mentioned is, we should develop a normative database of myopic patients to compare myopic patients, right? And uh, in a study done by me actually in 2016, I've shown that when you develop such a database, it actually performs better. So when you have myopic patients and compare other myopics, it gives a better result. False positive, false negatives are very low. It's almost perfect. But one thing you have to consider is that besides refractive error, there are other things which can affect the uh, false positive. What are they? So why this database are not enough is that building normal database customized for myops shows superior specificity sensitivity, but refractive error matching is not enough. If you just compare patients with minus six with minus six, that's not enough because they may have different excel length. So excel length matching is very important. They may have different kind of disc tilt and disc rotation, which also need to be matched. There's a study actually done after that, what is the study did in which they compared patient with same excel length, they compared, but with different kind of disc tilt. So some are obliquely tilted, some are right tilt, some are left tilt, and it shows that in spite of matching the excel length and refractive error, still there is false positive, false negative in patients with myopia. So it shows that normative data, even with myopia, is not good enough. You need to incorporate a lot of factors, also age, gender, ethnicity. There's too many variables to consider when you compare somebody with another person. So other considerations are what disc margin is quite difficult to delineate in my pair because of the presence of tilt and PPA. As I showed to you earlier, that alpha, beta, gamma, delta, there are four zones are there beside the disc, which is the peripheral atrophy, which can actually obscure and make it quite difficult for you to understand where's the disc, where's the cup, everything looks to be intertwined and blurred. The disc margin identified manual by SDOCT, OCDs are usually a combination of Brooks membrane and border tissue beside the Brooks membrane opening. So what does it mean? Uh, so when you when you see the disc margin using OCT, the disc margin you see is actually not the real disc margin what you want to see. So what I want to see is, sorry, there's a different slide. Yeah. So optidisc margin, what you want to see is actually a clinical construct or clinical uh, biomarker basically that coincides with the neural canal opening in the optic nerve head. So boundary of the neural tissue. So where the neural tissue is ending, I'll show a picture to you later, don't worry. So where the optic nerve head neural tissue is ending, that is the starting of the disc margin. That should be the case, but that doesn't happen. Usually what happens is that the disc you see through your uh, fundus photo or OCT is some of Brooks membrane and some border tissue below the Brooks membrane opening or BMO. So I'll show some pictures, go back to the slide again. So uh, if you see this picture here, you can see there's something called BMO or Brooks membrane opening. The gap from the this BMO to the ILM is called the BMO MRW. MRW is minimum rib width. So it has been shown that if you measure this gap, the minimum gap from BMO to the ILM, this measurement, this thickness is a good biomarker for glaucomatous changes. That means if you see that this BMO MRW is getting thinned over a year, that's a better identifier than just checking the RNFL thickness in OCT for glaucoma. So this BMO minimum rim width defined as the minimum distance between BMO and ILM is a good identifier. It shows that the RNFL thickness normally we get from OCT is actually comparable to that BMO MRW found through this technique. So this technique is not a something very new thing. It has been found since 2013 by Chauhan et al in uh, Canada but it's being less used till now. So this method gives less false positive than average RNFL thickness. So this is another technique which shows that the Chauhan study in 2013 shows that uh, the red pictures, CSLT, MRA, IR, these pictures are from the HRT. You know what is HRT, right? And B scan is shown here on the right side is from the OCT. So it shows that the BMO MRW from OCT is better 
compared to BMO HRW from HRT. So this same parameter, this uh, BMO MRW was tested between OCT and HRT and shows that OCT performs a bit better than HRT when you consider this parameter. So if you see this picture here again, this is a profile of the RNFL thickness. The black is the overall. So it shows that in case of BMO, over the BMO MRW for myopic control eyes, which is normal, the black line is in the green zone. So it should be right. If patient is myopic and control eyes, it's normal. So the black line is in the green zone. So it's good. It's not in yellow or red. But the average RNFL, if you see, it's in green mostly. But there's some portions which is white, some portions a little bit yellow, and some portions even in red. So it shows that the average RNFL has more variability, more changing changes compared to BMO MRW, which is more consistent. So this is a better marker to see whether the patient is having glaucoma, is it progressing or not. If you look at this picture, can you see the red dot, 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 red is outside the optic disc. So if, if, I, if I were you, what I'll do is if I see this, I'll say, hmm, this patient looks, the disc is tilted. This black zone is the disc margin, but which is not true. As I mentioned to you, the disc margin, what you see is not the true disc margin. What are you supposed to see? The red dots here, what you're seeing in this picture, red dot, 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 dot. This actual disc margin, which is supposed to be based on the, the anatomical structure, which is the BMO MRW. I'll show the real picture once again, sorry. So this is what I was talking about. So, you know, different person has different location. So the disc margin is supposed to be here for this patient corresponding to this picture. The disc margin is here corresponding to this picture. But some of them, the disc margin is overhanging. The disc margin goes beyond this border tissue. The problem starts there. The disc margin is protruding outwards. So you'll think that, okay, this is the Brooksman opening, but this is not true. The Brooksman opening is somewhere here. So what do you see from top? The picture, the fast view of the retina is not truly the optic disc margin, which is something different. That's what's shown in that picture, the red dot here. So if you see a picture with myopic glaucoma now, BMO MRW is more sensitive. Can you see the black line is in the green zone? It shows normal. And for the glaucoma, there's a dip in the red zone. Sure, it shows, okay, there's a defect. But for the RNFL thickness, again, there's a high variability. Some portions green, some portions even in white, that is super normal, some portions in red, of course. So BMRW is slightly better, but all the more or less, they're comparable. They're quite, both are quite good, but BMRW is slightly better. Okay, so the 3D NRR thickness is a BMO-based neural rim parameter, has a lower false positive rate, what I discussed just now. So, but HRT, as I mentioned to you before, testing shows that HRT, although performs quite okay, similar to OCD, it lacks a sound anatomical basis and hence lacks use. So again, the reason, the way, the mechanism, how HRT detects glaucoma is not very clear. It's based on reflectance. So based whenever a person, whenever clinicians don't understand how things are happening, how the diagnosis is made, then comes the problem. So we cannot rely on HRT because we don't know how it's happening much. So problem, other problems is that margin of the Brooks membrane sometimes moves away from the temporal disc border. So using Brooks membrane margin as disc border leads to false positive errors again. So let's not go too much detail about it. The main thing is that Brooks membrane opening and MRW is a good identifier, good biomarker for glucomatous changes. Let's move on to next things. We have a lot of things to cover. Disc margin, uh, as I mentioned to you, yeah, I, I've taken this slide already discussed to you. So I've showed you already the picture, how the BMO and Brooks membrane looks like, BT is border tissue, and how there's a BM overhanging in some patients where there's a problem of identifying the disc margin. Okay, so again, uh, this is a clinical picture using spectralis, which shows that the green dot is the BMO. So when you put plot the BMO really, this is the case. But when you see really, I mean, when you see the picture clinically, you may say, this is the disc. You may not uh, agree with the green dots. So that's why the clinically what we see and actually anatomically what is there histologically do not match all the time. So that's the problem of, uh, of doing OCT. So uh, you're not really actually identifying the disc margin. So that, mean, that means what? The cup disc ratio you're getting is actually false, which is not true. If you have the disc wrong, if you have the cup wrong, the cup disc ratio is also wrong. So you really don't know the progression, what is happening in the patient's eyes. So moving on to glaucoma progression. 
Okay, a lot of words here. I'll explain a little bit. First is test retest variability. So detection of glaucoma progression in the macular region is limited by test retest variability. That means that the variation of test, mostly in case of visual field, is very high. So when you perform visual field today, whatever you de decibels you get, and when you perform again after some time or next day, you get a different value. So the variability is very high. So whenever the variability is very high, it's quite difficult to say the change which is happening, is it true or not? Suppose today you get eight, tomorrow you get 16. Then how can you say that the change is, that eight change, is it physiological or is it really patho pathological due to glaucoma? You can't say that. That's a problem. Confounding effect of aging. You know, with age, everything goes down. Same with RNFL thickness. Same with visual field um, sensitivity. Everything goes down. So visual field defect becomes more with age. Retina becomes thinner. So everything changes. So that also has a own rate. So basically, when you perform a patient, patient perform a glaucoma study over a year, longitudinal study, cohort study, you have to take into account the factor that patient with aging also is causing glaucoma dust changes, I mean, RNFL thinning. So we always should have a normal control. Or if you don't have normal control, at least you should have a aging data saying that, okay, this ethnicity person, this gender people of this age, usually have this kind of an aging change. So you subtract that from the changes and you can say, okay, this is the change I'm seeing because of glaucoma, not because of aging. Lack of reliable parameter. So visual field testing, again, what parameter, what parameter to compare is it vfi is it md we don't know so there are a lot of variability in this parameter so vfi and md vfi is sensitive in early glaucoma md is sensitive in late glaucoma so which one to use for everybody we don't know effect of treatment so whenever you're following glaucoma patients over years they will definitely undergo some surgery some kind of a therapy uh, glaucoma medications agm is anti-glaucoma medications so that also affects the intraocular pressure changing the glaucoma status so that is a confounder then macular conditions, as I mentioned to you, like macular changes can actually uh, give rise to changes in the OCT. Also, there's something called magnification error. So suppose a patient's exilent is increasing. So with that, what happens? The image, the OCT is gathering also changes. There can be magnification or minification based on the change. Then measurement flow. That means what? So only central macula can be measured in advanced disease stage. But advanced stage baseline okay so basically when the disease the glaucoma is advanced what does it mean the rnfl thick thickness in the disc or the macula is very thin so it's quite difficult to understand the changes so even if there's a disease progression the change will be low whereas when the disease just started in early stages the thickness is quite high in that case even a little change will show prominently markedly in the oct but in late stage it's quite difficult to identify the change use of appropriate statistics Okay, so glaucoma research is a highly statistical uh, phenomena. So we have a lot of kind of statistics involved. Something called curve fitting. What is curve fitting? So curve fitting is, is basically nothing but uh, what kind of a uh, statistical equation can define, can, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, can actually uh, predict that glaucoma change is going to happen. So you know, a lot, there are a lot of equations called like y equals mx plus c is the regression equation. Then the other equations called linear mixed model or generalized estimating equation, which is mentioned here as LLM, LLM GE. They have a different equation. So which one is predicting that glaucoma changes most is important. I know some of you are not understanding what I mean by this. I'll show with the picture. What does it mean? So this is the picture. So look at the left picture up and down. It's showing GCL with linear GCL and quadratic. So linear means, you know, it's straight line. Quadratic is, it can be like an S, some different kind of curve. So whether you try to predict the glaucoma changes using a linear straight line or using a curve line, both give rise to a lot of false results, which are indicated by the red or blue circles. So the points which are circles, circle with red or blue, it shows that basically the blues are the glaucomas, red are the controls or normals. So those where glaucomas are sometimes mistaken as normals and those are normals are mistaken as glaucoma. So changes, the false happens both linear as well as quadratic. Same happens for RNFL. When you're testing RNFL using the linear equations or quadratic, quadratic equations, there can be false positive or false negative in both glaucoma and normals. So 
a study done in 2018 shows that the linear trend progression, basically the change every year, which is defined in papers, are not a very good identifier. Rather, baseline value is better. So I, I, you've seen papers, right, saying that the glucometers change, iron level thinning per year is 0.3 micrometers per year, or visual field change is 1 decibels per year. So that slope from regression equation is not a good identifier. Rather, a baseline value is. So if a baseline is high, that means there's a high risk of progression rather than a low. But again, that is not very clinically significant because just because the patient has good baseline doesn't mean that the patient will progress, right? So it's not very clinically meaningful, but it's statistically more meaningful. Okay, so statistics and clinical and, uh, approaches are a bit different. So how to control this potential problems? So controlling head tilt or torsion during imaging is very important. So basically, when you do a patient testing, you have to make sure all the patients are tested in the same way. They cannot tilt their head, can tilt their eyes, they cannot move because this little bit of tilting or torsion of the head or the eye can bring a lot of change in the image you capture. So it's very important that you keep the eyes, gaze, everything same fixed for every patient for every visit. Then you get a reliable measurement. Estimating within eye variability for individual patients. So it's important that to identify a patient how much is a normal change rather than looking for the change later. So if you can identify, okay, for normal patients, uh, three mm change is normal every year. But when it's glaucoma, it will be more than three. Then you know, okay, this is not normal change. So it's very important you identify patient with normal uh, eyes and then test them over time to find out the data. Use of artificial intelligence. I'll come to that later in a different slide, <coughs> how to use that. Implementing statistical approaches suitable for longitudinal data. So glaucoma study, as I mentioned, is a progressive disease, right? So you also have to follow the patient over time. You have to follow them over time. So it's a longitudinal cohort study. It cannot be a cross-sectional study. You cannot just test a patient today and say that, okay, that's it. This patient has glaucoma and that's it we see. Cannot say that. You have to follow them over time and see what the change is happening. So you treat better. But how to analyze the data? You have longitudinal change you have. So I'm a reviewer of a lot of journals. So I, I just see a lot of manuscripts with just mean change. So you say that there's a mean change of arnival thickness over six months or one year. That mean change doesn't mean anything. You have to show the change which is happening after accounting or adjusting for other factors like the corneal thickness or the corneal curvature, intraocular pressure, age, gender, race. So that is called adjustment. If you don't adjust, if you just do a mean comparison from baseline to the end point, that is not good enough. That is not publishable. No one will accept such a uh, manuscript for publication. So there are two ways to do that. One is LLM, LMM, and other is GEE. So basically what they do is, and one more is regression. So in that regression, LM and GE, you are basically seeing how much change in retina will happen over time if this patient has this age or this much coronal thickness or curvature given all the parameters. And if you just do a T-test with RNFL thickness from baseline to uh, after one year, that means only the change happens, but you don't know, you're not taking care of the factors which can change them like coronal curvature, intraocular pressure or surgery. So it's important you take care of the factors. Now, regression you perform when you take only one eye of a patient, when you take two eyes which are correlated you have to take something else called LMM or GEE. The different models are there for statistical approaches. So they're complicated. That takes a different chapter at all. We'll not go into that detail. Okay, now this picture is very important. What I've done here is, uh, I've not done, the paper what done is, the x-axis is the RNFL thickness and y-axis is the mean division visual field. So it shows that the relationship between the RNFL and visual field is not linear, it's curvy linear. Can you see it's a line? The line is curved. Now, the top portion here, it shows that there's a lot of change in the RNFL, but there's no change in mean division. This happens in early glaucoma. In early glaucoma, you see a lot of change in RNFL, but little change in the mean division. And this section is the late advanced glaucoma, in which there's a lot of change in the mean division, but little bit change in the RNFL thickness. That's why the line together, but it has not been successful yet. There are a lot of published articles, two or three are there, by Philip Medeiros, then 2018. They tried to combine together and it showed better result, but it's not practically possible to combine those two and give a diagnosis based on structure and function. 
Okay, in healthy eyes, the normal RNFL has fine and bright striations that radiate from disc and follows an arcuate distribution. Therefore, its reflectance pattern can be used to judge the health. So, you know, it's a rudimentary technique. It's not OCT. Just by seeing the reflectance of the retina, it's also a, a way of assessing the RNFL texture. But what is more important is that there's something called uh, rota. So, rota is something quite new. So, Professor Christopher Leong in Hong Kong, they have found this technique, RNFL optical texture analysis. What is that? It integrates thickness and reflectance from the OCT. And then use a white field detection a bit bigger than normal picture and that rota can actually identify glaucomatous changes better than just rnfl or just ganglion cell which is macula so if it is optidisc and macula separately how that can diagnose glaucoma the rota is combining them together and diagnosing better so this is a picture of rota this looks a bit rudimentary because this is still under research but this striations the black regions or the white regions based on that you can find out the defect. So the black regions are the problematic. So in this picture, this black striation, this problem is a problematic region. So here, similarly, the arrows are showing the black region is the problematic zone. So this rota map is still under research. It's not a lot of publications came out. Only one, I think, is published till now, which say, shows that when you consider the picture, which is optidisc and macula together, this rota gives a better diagnosis of glaucoma rather than just taking optic nerve or ganglion cell separately from macula. Okay, visual field is also very important. Myopic macular degeneration can cause visual field defect where there's a macular lesion and a suspicious disc. So we need to look for, wait for progression. It's very important that you don't jump into the conclusion that a patient is glaucomatous based on one visual field testing. It has to be repeatable and progressive. So patient who came to you today for assessment, you performed visual field twice. And you saw that, okay, the visual field is repeatable. That means there's definitely defect, but whether it's progressing or not is important. So ask the patient to come back after four or five or six months, and then you perform the test again. And if you see there's a progression, there's a worsening of either the nerve fiber or the visual field, then you can define that, okay, this patient is glaucomatous. Not before that. Before that is just suspected glaucoma. Myopic glaucoma often have some earlier paracentral scotomas due to increased RNFL defect involving the papillary macula bundle. So as I told you, in myopia, excel length is stretched and the nerve fiber bundles in superior inferior regions becomes ghost temporally. That creates an artificial visual field defect, which is central or paracentral, paracentral. But they're not true defect, right? They're not going to progress. They're going to stay there forever like that. So you cannot say, okay, that visual field is glaucomatous. You cannot say that. That is only due to myopia. And also one more thing I mentioned earlier, uh, if you perform 24-2, it, there's a high chance that you miss a real glaucoma in case of myopic eyes. So it's good to perform a 10-2 in patients with myopia and glaucoma. Okay, now moving on to intraocular pressure. Okay, so we all know Goldman tonometry is the gold standard intraocular pressure for uh, performing Goldman tonometry. For, but there are a lot of things are there like corneal thickness, corneal curvature, corneal biomechanics, especially Young's modulus. It changes. The, if the corneal thickness, curvature, and the softness of the cornea changes, rigidity changes, of course, the measurement also changes. So GAT is designed for only 520 microns of thickness. If the thickness of cornea is more than 520 or less than that, the pressure you're getting is not true, maybe less or more. If patient has more tears or more flows in the eye, you get a different false reading. If patient's curvature is more, if patient has astigmatism high, you get a false reading. Also, when you're touching a patient's eye, you increase the risk of the infection. And also, the GAT test is quite uh, semi-objective, rather, I will say, because you are matching two mice, right? The two semicircle you're matching. So it's quite objective. So to some, it may be touching already. To some, they may say, no, I've crossed already. So the entire technique is quite semi-objective, just like a retinoscopy. Retinoscopy, you cannot say it's objective or subjective. It's semi-objective. Okay, so next one is the Pascal. Pascal is slightly better than Goldman. Goldman, the tono head, the head is straight, but Pascal is curved just like a cornea. So it takes care of the curvature, but not entirely because the curvature of Pascal may not match with the patient's cornea. It may be, patient's cornea may be steeper, may be flatter. So to some extent, it becomes better, but it's not good enough. Pascal also gives a value called OPA or ocular pulse amplitude. What is that? Is the difference between the systolic and diastolic IOP. 
So intracular pressure changes with the blood pressure. So blood pressure, you know, there are two kinds of blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, one high, one low. So similarly, pressure also has two values, one high, one low. So it keeps fluctuating the Myers. So the two values, the middle point is the OPA. Tono pen, you know, tono pen is handheld, it's easier. But again, tono pen has its own dis disadvantages. Tono pen cannot estimate values more than 20 properly. It gives the underestimation of intracranial pressure. Similarly, there's something called eye care home tonometry. So all those things are problematic because patient performing it on their own eyes is quite difficult. Their hands may be shaking, they may have Parkinson's disease, they may have a lot of conditions or fixation problems, so they may not be able to do it. So home tonometry is not a very good idea. So there's something called IMATE SC. IMATE SC. What is that is they perform surgery in patients, not just animals, okay, patients, and they implant that chip in the eye, which can continuously measure intracular pressure by a reader. But of course, do you want to do that to yourself or to your patients or your family members? Of course, no. Who wants to get implantable surgery just for measuring intracular pressure? By seeing this photo, it will be get scared. So much bleeding for one measuring intracular pressure. So of course, this is not feasible. This is not doable. So what patient shifted is there's something called sensimet trigger fish. It monitors the intracranial pressure for 24 hours. So there's a strain gauge which detects change in the corneal shape. So basically, the theory behind this is that when the pressure becomes high, the corneal curvature becomes change. So how it happens? Pressure is high means cornea will become flattened. And that flattening in the, in the contact lens on the cornea will cause this gauge, which is the strain gauge, to change the shape. And it will send through the antenna, this antenna there, which sends the antenna, the information about how much change is happening. And you can record a change in the intracranial pressure. But the problem is that that machine gives something like this. There's a voltage on one side and time on the other. So you just see a change. What does it mean to you clinically? There's no meaning at all. There's no MMAG. There's no nothing else, no details. It just says there's a voltage change in this time, which is not clinically meaningful. So that's not very good. It just shows there's a change, a lot of change there with time. So there's a next level is there, something called contactless Benson sensor. What is that they're doing? It is theranostic. Theranostic means therapy and diagnostic. So this one has something called DDS. This DDS contains anti-glaucoma medications like timolol, malleate. And there's a sensor. The sensor, what it does, again, the same phenomena. If the pressure of the patient becomes higher, the corneal curvature changes along with corneal curvature, yeah. the lens curvature changes. And then that IP sensor gets stimulated and the sensor stimulates the DDS and you release timolol malleate on the eye for five days. So this has been tested in rabbits and it works very well, B but is not done in humans till now. So when you get a signal of pressure is going higher, there's a release of timolol and pressure goes down. Again, pressure goes high. Again, there's a signal pressure goes down. So this can work till five days. So after five days, take out the contact lens, fill up the timolol malleate. So again, that's a hassle. It's not very easy, but it's doable. That's what is shown here. And this sensor, what they're doing is that this sensor changes color. So this sensor was initially this gold-plated color. But as the pressure goes high, the gold-plated color, it is called a uh, anti-opal structure. Anti-opal becomes light blue when the pressure is slightly higher. If the pressure goes even more higher, it becomes dark blue. And it, what it also does is it checks the matrix metal protein or MMP. So some of you must be knowing that when there's a pressure increase, transient increase in pressure, the matrix metal protein MMP gets released in the eye. So when the patient is having a high pressure, they're supposed to secrete matrix metal protein in the eye and that is getting detected. That detection of matrix metal protein is causing the change in the color as well as the because of the curvature. And that shows that pressure is going high. So this is not therapeutic. It's just showing that, okay, pressure is going high based on the contact lens sensor. So these are the latest developments which is happening now. Again, this is done in pig eyes. It's not done in uh, humans till now. But the limitation of this all contact lens based intracranial pressure measurement is that <coughs> even I've done a study few days uh, last year, which shows that IP increase causes coronal curvature changes, but only in certain meridians, only in the steep or only in the flat meridian. That too based on whether the patients are emetropic or myopic. And other reports shows that there's no change at all. So the reports are quite contradictory. So along with increase in IP, 
the change in curvature is not fixed. It is not guaranteed. It may happen, it may not happen. So the contact lens sensor may work, may not work. And also, as I showed you, the recording change is in voltage and not in actual MMIG. So it lacks a correlation. You don't know what the MMIG means. And patient may not like contact lens device. It may not be comfortable to the patients. The, the curvatures available may not match. The fitting may not be well. And it's quite expensive and with limited base curves. So it's not a very idle thing to do. So there's something called ocular pressure estimator, OPE. So what is that is the idea is to measure intraocular pressure under closed eye condition. So patient's eyes are closed, patient is sleeping, then you measure. So the logic why this is done is that there should be logic for everything, right? So it has been seen that when patient sleeps at night during that time. So the test was done in patients who are sleeping. You wake them up at the middle of the night and test their pressure. So it has been seen that when you ch test the pr uh, pressure in the middle of the night, when you're lying down, lying down in a posture, lying posture, then the pressure is highest. So in glaucoma, in glaucoma diagnosis, to check the pressure at one point of time in the day during office hours is not enough to know the pressure. Pressure is changing at night, during day, early morning. You don't know pressure anytime you want. When patient is sleeping, patient is awake. For that, this was developed. So this technique of using ocular pressure estimator of under closed eyelid conditions uh, <coughs> was used, but it is not yet validated properly. Even we did a study in Manipal University a few years back. It's under publication in OVS. So uh, we did the same thing. We tried to develop a, a ocular pressure estimator, but it's not yet published and not yet clinically useful yet. So it's an idea till now. It's in concept stage saying that, okay, this is how we can measure. So basically put a pouch with a sensor on top of the eye, which is closed, and that pouch can detect the change on the, through the cornea and through the lid. And the sensor measures the change and gives you a value. Also, one thing important is that pupil assessment in glaucoma is very important. It's not RAPD testing using pen torch light or torch light I'm talking about. I'm talking about the autonomic dysfunction. So, you know, pupil response depends on both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, which is autonomic. Sympathetic is, which is uh, uh, dilation, parasympathetic is constriction. So that the pupil size is depends on both. So when there's glaucoma, patients have glaucoma, the glaucoma damages the IPRGC. What is IPRGC? Intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. So RG cells, there are many kinds of there. MRGC, PRGC, IP, lot of there. So the IPRGCs die and get, because of glaucoma. And that can express melanopsin, which absorbs blue light. So basically, using different kind of light stimulus, red, blue, and no light, it has been shown that you can make the pupil constrict and dilate, constrict dilate with certain amount, with different amount of light. So using that, based on the pupil reaction, based of the, of the blue light and red light, you can identify whether the patient is having glaucoma or not. So it's quite interesting, right? You're giving different kind of light for different durations and you're seeing based on the pupil constriction, is it normal or glaucoma you're trying to identify? Again, it is highly successful, but clinically not very useful because to use that machine in a clinics and to identify glaucoma, it's quite laborious because the data analysis is not simple. You record that through a machine that has to be transferred to a computer. You have to analyze it and then tell. So it's not clinically meaningful yet. So now again, people ask questions that why we are separating glaucoma and macular pictures? As in Rota, you saw that they're combining, right? The optic nerve and macular picture. So what they did is most commercial available OCD instruments measure the RNFL and GCIPL macula separately, except Triton. So if any of you have used Triton DRI OCT made by Topcon, you've seen that they have a combined macula and optic nerve uh, picture protocol. But you have to understand that if you do a photo, that's fine. But how are you going to use it? Okay, you measure the optic nerve and macula, but the machine should be such advanced so that it can analyze the data and tell you, okay, this patient is glaucomatous or not. So that has not come yet. Rota or whatever is being analyzed, combining pictures are still under testing. They're still being tested in animals and um, still under a developmental stage. So it's a brilliant idea to combine the macula and optic nerve together to get a together combined picture and then say patient is glaucomatous or not. But it's not yet in reality yet. It's still under consideration. White field RNFL then. Progression analysis of RNFL GCIPL, which is macula, reveals a significant portion of progressing eyes that neither alone can identify. So when you identify progression using optic nerve or macula, 
they're not good enough. Rather, a combination is better. So if you look at this picture, you see that the top picture shows that progressive RNFL GCI will thinning. So it's a combination. So the combination can identify the patient is progressing in 2017, July 4th. But if you see each one separately, the combination only identifies in September, November. So July, August, September, October, November. So four months delay, there's a seven to 11. There's a four month delay when you use the single ones, only RNFL, only GCI pill. Whether when you combine them together, four months earlier, you can diagnose, okay, patient is having a glaucoma. Can you see there's a red change here? The red change is because of the combination. But when you check only optic nerve or only ganglion cell, the, the direct direction is much later. Okay, there's something else called sparse group lasso. What is that? They have tried to, this is a new development again. They tried to reconstruct the disc using, by, uh, by integrating similarity between testing and reference images. So, you know, what they do is they first test 100 patients with glaucoma, 100 patients who are normal, and they have database, database again. So, they compare that with the patients who has come and try to reconstruct it and say which parts are missing. Based on the missing parts, they can say, okay, this patient is glaucomatous or not. So again, that has a good AUC. What is AUC? Area under the curve, which says that it's quite high. Closer to one means high. So the manual as well as the machine one, they're quite comparable. 0.83 for, or 84 for both. It looks good, but it still needs improvement. Again, this uh, is still at a uh, developmental stage, not clinically applicable yet. The not, next, I think two more remaining automated spatial analysis of the whole cup so what they, these people did is algorithms that this they developed an algorithm that segments segment means they delineate mark and analyze color photographs to quantify optic nerve rim consistency around the whole disc so every 15 degrees for the whole 360 degree of the cup or disc they're analyzing the disc neural rim margin and seeing whether the rim margin is healthy or not compared to again normals so accurately diagnosis glaucoma and healthy normals. Again, ARUC is quite good. Advantage, it requires data set less than with other algorithms. So it's good. It can be used with small uh, data sets, but it again needs validity. So again, everything is in a developmental stage. So what we usually do is we check the vertical cup disc ratio, right? We only take the vertical. We take the blue portion and the red portion and we combine and say, okay, cup disc ratio is 0.71 based on the measurements 330 465 so 0.71 but what they want to do is they're checking the entire disc not just vertical also horizontal also oblique every 15 degrees they're checking the disc margin and they're coming to a conclusion based on that sounds uh, reasonable right next is artificial intelligence and glaucoma so when you say ai it's a very broad term which means that there's image processing going on with expert systems that and that requires domain knowledge that means that requires a human to guide that program what to do and what is machine learning it's a subfield under ai machine learning that can learn from data and identify the outcome and new circumstances without being a having a human expert so you need, don't need a doctor or optometrist no one we don't need anybody to tell the machine what to do and what is right what is wrong you just tell do this for me find the glaucoma patients for me or find the normals for me it'll do it for you machine learning under machine learning, there's something called Deep Convolutional Neural Network, DCNN. This is supervised. Supervised means under a patient, under a human, under expert, like optometrist, ophthalmologist. It's a machine learning module model that utilizes a stack of hidden layers. So basically what it does is it gets a lot of images from you. You give a lot of images to the, to the, the Deep Convolutional Neural Network. It identifies the problems in it. You, while giving the images, you tell that this images belong to glaucoma, this images belong to normals. So it's the work of the deep network to find out what kind of peculiar structures is there in the glaucoma eyes, which is not there in the normal ones. So it's the responsibility of the DCNN to find out how glaucoma eyes differ from normals in terms of the images, and it gives you a value. But the problem is that in that case, there's something called black box problem. If you look at the last point here, black box. What is black box? This all artificial intelligence, machine learning, DCNN, what they do is they do everything without telling you how they're doing it. So whenever that happens, you lose confidence. You don't know how it's happening, 
how the interpretation, how the clinical decision making is happening, you don't know. So whenever you're in dark as a clinician, you don't want to rely on such a thing because it's more of a chance. Suppose your family member, somebody comes and AI tells that, okay, your mom has glaucoma or your dad has glaucoma. You don't want to believe that because you don't know how the diagnosis came to you. The diagnosis may be true, may not be true. Maybe it's very good, the machine is telling you, but how it came to the clinician, don't know. And also there's something called garbage in, garbage out. So while developing that AI, as I mentioned to you, you feed the machine with a lot of images of the glaucoma eyes or normal eyes. But suppose you do a mistake and give a glaucoma as normal or normal as glaucoma, you give garbage, right? You give a wrong product. So what comes out as an end product for the, patient, for the AI is also a garbage. You give garbage, garbage will come out. And also it needs a large data set. That means you have to give hundreds of images to the patient, a lot of characteristics, a lot of data you have to input, then, patient, then the AI can find out some uh, peculiar structure based on which it can identify normals and glaucoma. If you don't give enough, that the, the, uh, the, the AI you develop may not be good enough. So this is the evolution of AI in glaucoma, which was initially started by just giving images and, patient, and it'll give you results of abnormal normal then next stage was you give ent you enter internal pressure age visual field other characteristics it'll give you abnormal normal then third stage was again going back to images but this time there are more details are there and using the deep con network convolution network it is classifying as abnormal normal and the final stage now is you don't do anything just give images and is give telling you normal abnormal So last part is of this whole presentation is that the ideal structural evaluation of thickness parameters in myopic eyes should consider refractory error, excel length, disc rotation, disc, a lot of things you have to consider. So just by uh, just because you're using normative database doesn't guarantee that you'll get a right result. You may not still get a good result even after using normative database if you have not matched everything between the patients. So it's quite difficult to use a normal database. So we should move away from normal database and move to something else. Functional testing is very important, not just structural testing. So visual field is very important, especially 10-2 for myopic eyes. Evaluation of glaucoma in myopic eye requires a multimodal approach. That means multimodal means not just visual field, not just OCD, a combination. Using the most appropriate test is important. So how do you know most appropriate test? Whenever you see that eyes has been affected by macular disease, or peripheral RNA assessment must be preferred. So, you know, macula gets affected in, macula, in myopic eyes. So whenever you see myopic eyes with macula damaged, you don't perform GCIPL. It's a waste of doing that because either we're going to get a bad result. So stick on to optic nerve. Right? Similarly, if optic nerve is damaged, go back to macula. Understanding the limitations and potential source of error of each test is very important for the clinician to know to identify false positive, false negative errors. So results from different structural and functional tests corresponding with each other is very important. So when you see there's a visual field defect on the superior portion, OCD should have an inferior defect. You know, it's opposite. So inferior defect should be corresponding with superior defect. Similarly, superior defect in OCD should have an inferior visual field defect. That should be corresponding. Then you know that the defect is true. But if you see that, uh, superior OC defect, superior visual field defect. That means something has gone wrong, something amiss. So you cannot rely on such a measurement. Better diagnostic strategies needed to understand glaucoma, which is multifaceted and multifactorial. So glaucoma diagnosis, analysis, st statistical data analysis is a huge approach. It's not simple. It's not one day, uh, one presentation cannot tell you everything. But of course, it shows that there's a plethora of knowledge there and plethora of things for you to learn from this presentation or from your own knowledge. You have to learn a lot to know more about glaucoma. Thank you for your patient listening. Feel free to ask if you have any questions. Um, and uh, just want to let you know that I'm doing research on my and glaucoma in UK. So getting patients is quite difficult here. So if you have patient database, you want to collaborate with me, feel free to email me. I'm sure, uh, sorry, I forgot to give my email ID to you. Maybe I can write down that for you. My email ID is s.biswas2 at aston.ac.uk. So I'm happy to collaborate with you. So I'm good at statistics. I, I, I can write articles. So if you have a lot of data waiting to be analyzed or you want to collaborate with me for a few of the st studies in my PR glaucoma, please feel free to collaborate with me and ask questions to me. That's it for today. 
Thank I'll you so much. The, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Satyan, for that, uh, I think, comprehensive talk which you covered on what is yet to come and what is in the research and what we are already doing. So I think you covered everything in terms of uh, what is available and what we need to uh, look for. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. No problem at all. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first question I think when you were talking about in the beginning was the relation of myopia with the open angle glaucoma. So could you just, you know, kind of give some tips on how are they related? If there's anything you would like to comment. Sure. So it has been shown that patients with myopia has a three to four times higher risk of uh, open angle glaucoma. So how that happens is that whenever a patient is myopia, the excellent is growing, stretching. So the stretching may cause damage in the lamina cribrosa in the sclera or may not cause. So if there's a damage in the lamina cribrosa, that weakens the optic nerve head. And that weakness of the optic nerve head causes the damage of the nerve fiber bundles. That causes visual field effect and optic nerve head damage. That's as simple as that. Some patients it happens, some eyes it doesn't happen. So of course, when I say three times uh, risk is there, that means that, uh, Few, three or four percent of my pick eyes develop glaucoma. The rest, 97 percent, remains normal. So those three percent, which is high, uh, uh, having glaucoma with myopia, is at risk because of the changes happening in the eye. Right. Awesome. Great. And I think you also did, uh, you know, tell us about the BMO opening marking. So. Yes. Any idea about, uh, you know, the BMO markings, are they available within some instruments or they have to be done manually and things like that? And are there variations in that? Very good question, Chitra. So beam opening are done manually. So again, it's not simple. So you have to take the image, you have to first export the image from Spectralis or which you're machine using. And then you have to have a MATLAB program software to delineate that beam opening. And again, as I mentioned to you, a limitation is that a lot of eyes has a very faded BMO. So you cannot really identify the BMO. Where is the BMO? So there's a problem. So that's why it's not clinically that useful yet because BMO marking is done manually. And if done manually also, it takes a lot of time and also it's blurred sometimes. So it's not very clinically useful as of now, BMO marking. All right. And would you see any variation between different types of OCT uh, which we use. So we have the SD OCT, the time domain and the spectralis. So any thoughts over using which one uh, in terms of our diagnosis and uh, assessment? Uh, uh, of course, it's very simple. As a swept source OCT is of course, definitely gives much more clearer image than SD OCT. SD OCT is, has been the gold standard so far, but SD OCT has revolutionized, changed uh, imaging. So definitely SS OCT is much better in, than SDOCD in terms of imaging BMO. But still, nothing is foolproof. There's no guarantee that you'll get the best thing, but the variation will be less different with subsocity than SDOCD. That's for sure. Yeah. And any involvement or contribution of the posterior pole in terms of analysis of glaucomatous myopic patients? So because we understand that the posterior pole is something which we also need to be careful of. Uh, mm -hmm. So any thoughts on that? Okay. So uh, as I mentioned that a uh, uh, lot of studies have been done, which shows that some studies shows that macular changes are replicated in terms of, I mean, macular changes happens in case of uh, glaucoma, early changes. Same thing happens in optic nerve also. But again, uh, recent studies showing that macular changes may not be that great, may not be that useful to detect early changes. Or maybe they're comparable with with optic nerve aid. So I think optic nerve aid and macula both are quite equally useful to detect early glaucoma, if not less maybe. But I think to me, uh, macula uh, may be a bit inferior in terms of a than uh, optic nerve aid. So optic nerve aid may be a better marker for detecting glaucoma than uh, macula. I think there's a question. Eh? What is the contribution of posterior yeah. pole of asymmetry analysis? Okay, similarly asymmetry analysis. Yeah, so asymmetry between the two eyes also can be. Yeah, uh, but again, as, as mentioned to you, maybe macular is less useful than optic nerve. Optic nerve maybe is more the change more because the simple reason is that the problem is happening at optic nerve first, then going to uh, macula. The change, the lamina cribrosa getting damaged is happening first. That's the closest to the optic nerve. Aid. So damage goes to optic nerve aid first, then it dies, the RNFL are dying, and further going to macula. So the change in macula will appear 
bit lesser, slower anatomically than optic nerve head. So great. And uh, probably this uh, one is uh, mm -hmm. more towards clinical oriented. So, you know, now we know about the BMO and we know about there are variations in terms of looking at the OCT images. So what would be your take home clinical message, uh, Dr. Santan, in terms of, let's say I have a patient, what do you think are the couple of uh, key points which I may look at before I should diagnose glaucoma? Sure. Uh, this question also coincides with the last question. Somebody as Ayush Dhanesh has mentioned, as I discussed earlier, why there are central and parasinal scotomas in macular myopic glaucoma in the chat mentioned. Yeah. yeah. So basically, when you have a patient myopia, for, when you first test in OCT, you may get a defect, which is not true, which is false positive you're getting. So make sure you perform a visual field test. But again, 24-2 may not capture the visual field defect if there's a true glaucoma. So it's good to perform 10-2. And central, paracentral, why they're happening is that because of the excellent change. So when the eye is getting stretched anterior posteriorly, the, the nerve fiber bundles, which are supposed to be inferior superior, they're getting temporally shifted. They're going towards temporal side more. Temporal side means towards the macula, not a nasal side, towards the macula shifting more. That change in the optic nerve head is causing a manual defect, which is the manually, the uh, nerve fiber bundles are shifted more. That is causing a defect which is appears in the visual field testing. So that visual field testing, when it comes black, what does it mean? The nerve fibers present that portion and they're not working. When you're giving light to that portion, they're not working, but that's not true. All the nerves are fine, except that they've shifted more. And that shifting is causing the optic nerve head to appear in a different place than it should be. And giving a false black spot in the visual field somewhere else which is not supposed to be that is causing the central or paracentral scotoma because of change of the pattern of the nerve fibers yeah so, so yeah so basically yeah. when you see a patient with myopia you must perform the oct and when you perform oct you must look at the thickness map thickness deviation map both and the stereo photograph optic nerve head picture along with that visual field testing if it follow all the things there's less likely that you will misdiagnose a person with glaucoma which patient is not truly and yeah. forget about the intraocular pressure. Intraocular pressure is not a diagnostic feature at all in glaucoma. Patient with 10 mmHg can have glaucoma. 30 mmHg may not have glaucoma. Yeah, so that, that's a very important thing. I think uh, we all need to understand that uh, intraocular pressure is probably a starting guide, I would say, rather mm -hmm. than you know using yeah. it as a main criteria. Uh, for mm -hmm. diagnosing, we have to look at the overall picture and, you know, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, structural, functional changes have to be looked at before we kind of come to any conclusive uh, diagnosis. So, But again, if you see a patient, if you confirm a patient has glaucoma, then you have to, again, decrease the pressure, right? So yeah, pressure right. is not for diagnosis, but once you get a diagnosis based on optic nerve head and visual field, you have to decrease the uh, pressure to manage the patient. Right. Wonderful. Great. How deep AI research and early recognition of glaucoma is made possible? Uh, it's possible only if AI can, so I can see, can have access to the inputs of all the instruments rather than using single report. Yeah, I mean, there are many kinds of research going on. One is just based on fundus photos. One is based on fundus photo and additional inputs like age, gender, other risk factors. So it depends on the type of research. So mainly it's mostly based on the optic nerve pictures. So you input optic nerve pictures, find a test database, and you test that test database against your patient. So everything is comparing against somebody else. But how that AI is coming to the conclusion, diagnosis is not clear. It's a black box phenomenon. It just takes up something from the photo and say, okay, this is glaucoma, but it's good, useful. It's 90% sensitive, very good. Just we don't know how it's happening. Correct, yeah. So I think... Uh... AI is here to kind of help us, but probably in the near future, it will get better and better. As we said, you need more and more data and uh, mm -hmm. and that, that that will help us in our, in our clinical decision making, I guess. So it will complement our uh, clinical decision making. So that's great. So uh, I think with that, uh, we have, you know, taken up all questions. So we thank you so much, uh, Dr. Santan, for that uh, comprehensive uh, you know discussion and uh, giving your insights about what's happening and what's going to come in the future for for glaucoma diagnosis as well as for glaucoma 
uh, monitoring. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. And thank you for Kriti for giving this opportunity and good OLS. Good, you're doing good, great job. Yeah, most welcome. Uh, we do have session plan over the next year. Uh, this is the last session for the year 2023. Uh, we do have session plans over the next uh, new year. And until then, take care and be safe. And I hope to see you during the next sessions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sant, and once again for spending the Sunday afternoon with us uh, from the UK. Thank you so much. It's my, it's my, my pleasure. Yeah. Celebrate your festive uh, weeks. Uh, Christmas is up uh, in the coming week and you also have uh, New Year, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. So I hope you enjoy with your family and we'll be back with some action at OLS uh, next year. Take care and be safe. Bye-bye.